comment on what the Peel Lecture is. Stan Peel was a professor in the department here, um, died two years ago. Um, he was a famous dynamicist and the first member of the astrophysics group here in Santa Barbara. Um, he was a beloved mentor to many students here, and it's a special privilege today to have a speaker here who was never his student or postdoc, but I think as a junior researcher received quite a bit of mentoring from Stan. Um, Robin Canup um, is an astronomer at the Southwest Research Institute that's in Boulder, Colorado. Um, she got her PhD at University of Colorado Boulder and was already getting grant funding and things like that, federal funding by the time she graduated and managed to book a deal to stay on at Southwest Research Institute in the beloved city of Boulder. Now as I understand it, Stan visited there many times and I think uh, Robin and others at Southwest West Research Institute worked hard to try to get Stan to, to move there and stay in Boulder, given how active Stan was. I imagine he did consider this, so we're, we're lucky we kept him here in Santa Barbara. Um, as part of this book lecture, I, I want to point out and thank, again, many of the faculty here and even Robin herself that have donated to make this annual event possible. Uh, thank you. Um, we also have with us today special guest Stan's wife, Priscilla, and his son, Douglas. The other son, Bob, is a physics professor in Florence, so he can't be here today. Um, Priscilla has really taken it upon herself to go through Stan's old scientific papers and books and things. Mm -hmm. Just an incredible job of organizing these things. And one benefit of that is that our undergraduate organization, UDIP, um, today received several big boxes of textbooks that are going to go in the, the PSR that you belong to stand, and are now going to be used by our undergraduate students for, for years to come. So I want to thank, is, is Rafi uh, Sharenian here? Yeah. Thanks to Rafi for leading that effort. So let's give you that a hand and proceed. Now, I really know very little about the topic of today's talk, satellite formation, except that, I don't know, I heard the moon was ejected from the Earth or something at one point in the past. So I'm really looking forward to Robin's talk. Take it away, Robin. Thank you. Uh, first, let me just say what an honor it is to give this lecture. Stan was, without question, one of the most uh, respected and indeed beloved people in our field, and was my close friend and colleague for almost 20 years. I first met Stan by reading his papers, of course, and soon after that in person. Uh, as a young graduate student and postdoc studying planetary dynamics and orbital mechanics, uh, Stan's papers, uh, many of them were like de facto textbooks in our field. His works were characterized by um, amazing mathematical rigor combined with very clear physical intuition. And in some cases, he actually developed whole ways of approaching problems that we still use today. So in my papers, uh, most of them, I say, contain at least some element of something that I learned by reading one of Stan's papers. And I'm very proud of that in one case, there was one paper by Stan, this one here, that I'll talk about in the talk, that was actually inspired by a paper that I wrote with Bill Ward in 2002. Stan was uh, broadly recognized for many seminal contributions to the field, not just in this area, but in other areas. Uh, he received the uh, Cleveland Newcomb Prize um, for his work that predicted volcanism on Io prior to the Voyager encounter. He received the Lifetime Award for Achievement of Brower Award in the Division of Dynamical Astronomy, the Kuiper Prize in the Division of Planetary Sciences, and was a member of the National Academy. Now, despite all of those accomplishments um, and the extreme level of uh, rigor associated with his work, he was in person um, a delightfully warm, pro 
approachable and humble person. And um, I think it's fair to say that one of the reasons that we have this lecture series today is not just because he was an exceptional scientist, but also because he was an exceptional person. This is one of my favorite pictures of Stan. Um, I always remember him in one of two modes. He was either deeply concentrating, in which case he was very serious, or he was smiling. Either one. This is Stan at a dinner at our home in Boulder with uh, two other greats in planetary dynamics. Uh, that's Peter Fulbright, and this is Al Cameron. So Stan was perhaps the most objective scientist I've ever known. He was extremely self-critical. When he wrote a paper, he would send it out, not just for external review, of course, through the normal process, but he would send it out to colleagues and ask each of them to please critique it for him. If he found any error, which was extremely unlikely, or if he had a suggestion for how to improve the argument and convey it to Stan, he would respond with extreme and uh, genuine gratitude that you had helped him improve his work. For Stan, that, that human, that human uh, wish we all have to be right, that was always made secondary to his desire to know the right answer and to be grateful for anything and anyone that helped him further that goal. So this is one of my favorite sentences of Stan wrote in a review paper that we wrote. The author's prejudices and judgments will no doubt be evident, but we hope advice from our colleagues has tempered the impact of such. <laughs> so so this, this is quintessential stand, but, but so, so we say we've tried our best to be objective and to describe everything as clearly as we can, but remember, there are still our opinions and thoughts in there, and so we should correct for that. You know, how often do you read that at the beginning of the paper? Stan was also incredibly uh, fair-minded and uh, gracious in his interactions with his colleagues. In 20 years, I saw several occasions where there were conflicts between people, disagreements, things would start to get a little heated. And Stan would enter into the situation and in a very honest and open way, with full goodwill, speak to both parties, and inevitably help resolve the situation for the better. And in fact, uh, Stan has been very much a scientific mentor for me, but also a mentor in how to interact scientifically. And to this day, when I'm in a, a tricky situation, how should we handle this situation with colleagues? I think to myself, if I'm uncertain what to do, well, what would Stan have done? And so he's had that kind of influence, I think, on all of us that live him well. So Stan, a uh, bunch of Stan's work concerned the orbital evolution of some of the major moons in our solar system and how that evolution could affect their thermal interior uh, state and things like volcanism. So my own research looks at the earlier stage, how these objects formed. So we're blessed with this wide array of satellites in our solar system. In the inner solar system, we have just our moon and the various tiny moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. Then around the gas planets, each of these planets has a system of moons and rings, most dominant Saturn, of course. And then around the uh, large uh, hydrophile objects, the TNOs, uh, of which uh, Pluto is uh, a member of the class, we also now know the population of moons. So these are fascinating objects. Some of them have active volcanism, subsurface oceans, atmospheres, and so they're interesting planetary objects in their own right. But I'm going to talk about uh, one of the simplest properties of these systems and how we potentially can explain it. And that is the mass of each of these satellite systems when compared to the mass of their parent planet. So when you plot that mass ratio, the mass of each satellite system to the planet mass, as a function of the planet mass of Earth mass is here, you see two very different distributions. Around all of the planets that are solid, either rocky or icy rock, we see satellite systems with a very broad range of mass ratios. From the Martian moons that contain only 10 to the minus 8 times Mars' mass, all the way up to Charon, the proportional the most massive satellite that contains more than 10% of the mass of Pluto. In stark contrast are the satellite systems around the gas planet, 
units that all have mass ratios that cluster around a value of 10 to the minus 4. So I'm going to make, it, make the case in this talk that these two different distributions reflect two primary uh, formation processes for these moons. The first being the formation of moons by the collision of solid planets, origin and impact. And the second being what we call co-formation, which is essentially the formation of a circumplanetary accretion disk by the inflow of gas and small entrained solids in orbit around a gas planet as it finishes its accretion. So I'm first going to talk about the origin of satellites by impact. And in that case, uh, the best studied case by far is the origin of our moon. Our moon has about 1% of the mass of the Earth, so on that plot, it's relatively on the upper end. We know from the moon's bulk density and some other indicators that the moon has an unusually small iron core. So the Earth's core is about 30% of its mass, and the moon's iron core is only between 1% and 2% of its mass. So we know that something will be formed the moon, uh, selected for the outer silicate layers of a differentiated planet, perhaps, and selected against incorporating the typical abundance of metallic phases that you find in the core of a terrestrial planet. We know from the oldest lunar rocks that the moon is a primordial body, that it dates back to only about 60 million years after the oldest known solids that we find in the universe. So from this we know that the moon formed uh, during the era of planet formation. And we also know that the moon's orbit has expanded due to tidal interactions with the Earth. This idea is very simple. So the effect of the, uh, the moon's gravity on the shape of the Earth can be understood by uh, considering that the gravitational acceleration by the moon on the Earth differs, of course, uh, with position on the Earth. It's strongest at the sub-moon point. It's weakest at the most distant point on the Earth's fat side and intermediate on the size of the Earth. Now, if you difference these uh, force vectors from the moon's force at the Earth's center, you get these vectors here. And those are what we call the differential, that's the differential tidal acceleration. So the moon's gravity tends to flatten out the shape of the Earth. Now, we see this primarily in the Earth's oceans in, and, and make it uh, elongated along the direction between the Earth and the moon. Now, this would be the alignment if the distortion of the Earth's figure occurred instantaneously in response to the moon's gravity. It doesn't occur quite instantaneously. There's dissipation in the Earth achieving its equilibrium state. And the time necessary for it to form that state, because the Earth rotates with a somewhat faster angular velocity than the moon orbits, that tidal bulge rotates in front of the moon, as indicated by this offset this angle here. And that bulge now lies ahead of the Earth-Moon center line. And so it exerts a positive torque on the Moon's orbit. This torque causes the Moon's orbit to spiral slowly outward over time as the Moon gains angular momentum. And it slows down the rotation of the Earth with time. The astute student in the audience may notice that there's a bulge on the back side of the Earth that is actually lagging behind the Earth-Moon center. And they ask, wouldn't that tie your Robin produce a negative torque on the moon's orbit? And the answer is, yes, it does. But the tie on the near side of the Earth, because it's closer to the moon, is larger. And so its effect dominates. So the net effect is that over time, the moon's orbit expands, and the Earth slows, slows down, and the whole process conserves angular momentum. So whereas today, the moon is at 60 Earth radii, we have our 24-hour day, conservation of angular momentum, integrate back in time, the moon originally formed in a much closer orbit to the Earth, and the Earth was rotating much faster, with about a five-hour day. So the giant impact theory for the origin of the moon uh, has been the leading theory for decades now. It was first proposed in the mid-70s, but really became the preferred theory in the mid-1980s, as evidenced by this paper by Alan Boss and Stan. So the idea is here that as the Earth was finishing its accretion, it collided with another planet-sized object. The collision was oblique, and therefore could explain the initial rapid spin rate of the Earth. 
and this collision ejected material into orbit around the Earth from which the moon formed. This theory is favored because it does, it provides a natural way to explain Earth's initial spin, the Earth moon system and everything. You can imagine that if both of these objects were differentiated into iron cores and outer silicate mantles, and if the ejecta that went into orbit came primarily from the outer layers, which it turns out that it does, then you could naturally explain why the moon should be depleted in iron. And so that's another big strength of the impact theory. And finally, we now think from our models of planet formation that these large-scale collisions were common during the final stages of forming Earth-like planets. So when we, when we modeled the accumulation of planets from the disk of material orbiting the sun, during an initial period of growth, many planets will grow from the sweep up of local material in their annulus of the disk. But this initial phase of growth only produces objects that are, say, moon to Mars size. So we think the final stage of assembling uh, the terrestrial planets involved initially, say, tens to perhaps a hundred of protoplanets that were initially in relatively circular orbits. Now this system is on long time scales unstable. Gravitational perturbations between the objects caused their eccentricity, orbital eccentricities to grow. This led to crossing orbits and ultimately to mutual collisions. Now the collisions acted like a process of elimination and the number of planets kept being decreased as some planets grew and others were destroyed until we were left with four stable planets. And when you look at the statistics of when these types of impacts occur, in direct n-body simulations of this process, you find that the impacts occur in the tens of millions of year time frame, consistent with the age of the oldest, oldest lunar rocks. So one of the things we've tried to do for several decades is to understand what type of impact do we need to affirm the moon? Because since we know so much about the moon, we have samples of the moon, for example, we would hope that this is the type of problem we should be able to solve with great certainty, and this could then provide um, an important constraint on planet formation models in general. So obviously we, we can't do experimental, uh, yeah, we can't do experiments with planets colliding. So uh, in good astrophysics fashion, we build experiments by designing uh, numerical simulations. SPH is the uh, method of choice for modeling planet collisions. This is a 3D uh, Lagrangian method. It's describing the colliding bodies by a large number of particles whose individual evolution is tracked as a function of time. So in these simulations, each of, the, each of the particles is assigned a composition. It's either a silicate mantle particle or an iron core particle. So we can track uh, whether or not the moon ends up with the right amount of iron, for example. Now each particle is not a physical particle. These aren't. Um, these aren't bouncing balls. Each particle in these simulations is representing a distribution of matter across a volume of space whose dimension is set by something called the smoothing length of the particle. And during the simulation, the smoothing length of each particle is adapted so as to maintain overlap of each particle with some minimum number, typically tens of other particles. And so this allows the simulation to smoothly resolve the flow, even in regions that are relatively poorly resolved. So I'm sure many people in the audience may be familiar with this method. It's used in many different applications, including astrophysics. For planetary collisions, these are the, that are of this scale, these are the effects that we typically include. Uh, so at each time step, we're calculating the acceleration of the particles due to pressure forces, uh, explicit self-gravity with all the other material in the simulation, and um, a um, artificial viscosity term that accounts for the dissipation of shocks when particles converge. We're also calculating the change in energy of each particle, the pressure and the shock dissipation. And then the equation of state at each time step is then called to tell us the pressure, and if it's a good equation of state, things like the temperature and the fraction of vapor and melt um, as a function of the input density and specific internal energy. And the equation and the um, simulation shall show incorporate the so-called annuals equation of state, uh, which actually has more lines of code than the SPH code so. <laughs> so here is what has much later been come to know, uh, come to be known as a canonical um, 
moon-forming impact. So lower left, this is the Earth. We're looking down from above. The upper right is a Mars-size, it's not Mars itself, Mars-size impacting object that's going to hit the Earth in an oblique impact in the counterclockwise sense. So after the initial impact, the impactor is sheared out to this arm of material. It's often the case that a portion of the impactor may gravitationally self-collapse and re-impact the Earth. In this case, it turns out that that clump right there is comprised primarily of the iron core from the impactor. So with that secondary impact, most of the iron from the impactor, that was assumed to be Earth-like in its iron composition, ends up getting removed from orbit. So after about 24 hours, that's the length of the simulation, you're left with an Earth that's rotating with a five-hour day, surrounded by a disk of material that's depleted iron and has a couple of lunar masses in it, and enough mass and angular momentum to form the moon <coughs> subsequently outside the motion What was the rotational period of the Earth before the impact? So in this case, it was rotating off. So uh, there have been several papers where we've uh, varied the pre-impact spin state of the Earth. And uh, the interesting result is that most rotational states don't change the outcome a lot until the pre-impact angular momentum starts being comparable to or greater than the impact angular momentum, which kind of makes sense. So this is a, uh, a very archaic, by modern standards, 2D rendering of the simulation where we're just overplotting the particles. So this is uh, a better rendering of the same simulation that will uh, let you see what's happening and the effect on the Earth. I'll point out that the color scale here is such that any particle that's red at low pressure is 100% vaporized silicate. Right, so that's a set of scale. There's the initial collision. You can see this big wave around the Earth from the impact. Here's the secondary collision of the core from the impactor. Now, the, the viewing angle is slowly shifting. So, now right now, you're seeing, you're in the equatorial plane of the disk. You can see the Earth's oblate due to its rotation. The disk that's produced by the scale of events is a mixture of vapor, uh, vaporized rock and molten rock. So these, these events are large enough that they distort the shape of the Earth itself. And so that brings me to a, a, a sort of basic question. What, what is it that gets material into orbit around the Earth? So if we, if we launch something from the surface of a spherical planet, and it's above escape velocity, it'll escape. And if it's below that, it'll go up and come back down and re-hit the Earth. But it doesn't go into orbit around the Earth. So something else is happening here besides just a straight ballistic trajectory. So let me describe uh, what that is. So if we have an impactor that's approaching uh, the Earth at some velocity, if it hits the Earth obliquely, which we, we tend to need an oblique collision to get the angular momentum of the Earth correct, then instantaneously there's a strong velocity shear uh, imparted on the impactor. Obviously the parts that run directly into the planet are decelerated strongly, and they transfer angular momentum to the planet and start spinning. The outer portions of the impactor that miss the planet keep on going. And so what you often see in the first hours after one of these impacts is that the debris from the impactor forms an almost trailing spiral arm type structure. Maybe not spiral, but just a trailing arm. So if you look at the material of the outermost portions of this arm, the inner portions of the arm are ahead of them. And interactions between this material and that material lead to a positive torque on the outer material. Similarly, that shock wave that propagates across the Earth's surface from the initial impact tends to also be located ahead of this outer material. And so its gravitational interactions with this material lead to a positive torque in that material too. 
And you can see the effect of that if we look at the same simulation but with a different kind of movie. So here the, we're looking at the final state, and the color is a mapping of where the particles ended up. So the yellow particles are those that ended up in the disk, the stuff from which the moon would be made. The blue particles are the ones that ended up in the Earth, and the red particles, there aren't too many of them, they're hard to see, are the ones that escaped. So if we maintain that mapping and run the simulation backwards, we can then see where the material is that ends up in the disk. In other words, where is the material uh, coming from that will end up in the moon? And when you do that, you see that indeed, the yellow particles come predominantly from this outer end of the impact of the material. And here's that shot wave on the planet that you can much more easily see in 3D. So it's a general property that we've found that in most of these impacts that produce disks that will later accumulate into moons, the material that goes into the disk comes primarily from the impacting object rather than from the target Earth. So this has a couple of uh, implications. In terms of the moon's origin, this has been a motivating question really for the last 10 years of our work on moon origin. And so let me describe to you why this ends up being such an interesting finding. When you compare the lunar samples to uh, Earth rocks, they have their differences, but notably they are extraordinarily similar in their isotopic compositions across many elements. Oxygen is the most uh, famous one, but there are a host of other elements as well. Now if we look at meteorites, that come from parent bodies in the asteroid belt, or even meteorites from Mars, they generally look very different from the Earth. You put them on an isotope plot, and they look distinctly non-Earth-like, whereas the Moon and the Earth plots points will line on top of each other. And so the question is, if we had this, if we had this giant impact that formed the Moon, and most of the material that went into the Moon came from the impacting planet, and not the Earth, and if the impacting planet looked different from the Earth in its composition, say, like Mars looks different on the Earth, then how did we end up with an Earth and Moon that have identical compositions? And so that's, uh, that's motivated now another half dozen new types of models in the past 10 years, and some ideas about processes that might modify uh, the composition of the disk after the impact, say, mixing between the disk and the Earth. So that's a, that's a great field and I'd be happy to take questions on it, and that's the subject of another great talk. But I want to um, pull back here and cover a little bit of a broader implication of these findings, which is because the, the emplacement of material into orbit is essentially a geometric effect for a lot of these impacts, what that means is if you change the size of the impactor relative to the target, when you change the impact velocity or the impact angle, you can get very different outcomes. So the simulation on the left is a collision of two icy objects at low velocity, very oblique, um, that have uh, similar masses initially. And for these types of um, systems, you can actually form very large satellites intact from the collision. And in fact, we think that this type of collision is necessary to form Charon, which has the largest mass ratio of any satellite. Now over time, because this is what we do, we improve resolutions, we use, uh, we use faster computers, and um, we've even uh, adopted a particle splitting uh, method in our recent simulations. We're now able to resolve these orbit ejection effects at much finer resolution. And at, at lower, at smaller impactor sizes, not only are gravitational forks important, but also the pressure gradient effects of vaporizing material can help you get material into orbit. The takeaway is even very small impactors, relatively, this would be a basin size impactor on Mars, for example, actually forms a certain planetary disk and we think could have eventually led to tiny bubbles and demos. So impacts are a process that by virtue of their variability can give us satellites with a wide range of properties. So let me switch to talking about the moons around the gas plants. Probably the most famous four moons, 
sides are moving, the Galilean satellites. They're on uh, nearly circular coplanar orbits. The inner three moons, Io, Europa, and Ganymede. Ganymede is the most massive. I'll return to that point later in the talk. The inner three participate in the Laplace resonance, so their orbital periods are in energy ratios of 4 to 2 to 1. So if you take the mass of all these moons and add them together in ratio to that of, of Jupiter, their uh, satellite to planet mass ratio is 2 times 10 to the minus 4. So let's look at the system at Saturn. So on face, it looks very different than the Galilean system. Instead of four big satellites, we have only one big satellite. This is Titan. There are lots of other moons, but they're all much less massive. And of course, we have the massive uh, ice-rich ring system, and there are also small inner icy moons here that I haven't pictured. But again, if you take the mass of all these objects and we ratio it to the mass of Saturn, the mass ratio is 2.5. So now we think that each of our gas planets would have had a different specific growth and accretion history. So therefore, this commonality in mass ratio is remarkable. So we think these satellites formed by what we call co-formation. So the idea here is that at the end of the giant planet's growth, when it can contract it, to something somewhat larger than its current size, but still um, uh, within a factor of few of its current size, for example. Then inflowing gas to the planet and any entrained small grains in the gas would have flowed into orbit around the planet and formed a disk. So this is a high example simulation. We're looking down on the plane of the solar system. The, uh, the potential of the sun is in the middle, and this is a Jupiter mass planet. And it's interacting with a gaseous nebula around the sun. So if we zoom in around the planet, you can see what the flow streamlines look like in the vicinity of the planet. So the crosses here are the Lagrange, Lagrange points. The dashed arrowed lines are the streamlines of the flow. And essentially, as this material flows into the middle sphere of the planet, it typically has more specific angular momentum than can be accommodated by accreting directly onto the planet. Instead, it has to flow in orbit around the planet and form a disk. So we have this disk of gas, primarily hydrogen and helium, and it would be carrying with it grains, a meter size and smaller, of rock mass. So this is the environment that we imagine uh, these satellites forming. So one of the important um, advancements in recent decades has been uh, the understanding of how secondaries that are orbiting within a gaseous disk will gravitationally interact with that gas disk, which in the back reaction may then cause their orbits to be substantially modified. So this is another hydrodynamic simulation of a moon with approximately the mass of a Galilean satellite in orbit around a planet within a gas disk. So the gravity of the moon uh, perturbs the disk and from its resonant locations in the disk induces the formation of pressure waves in the gas disk. These waves propagate as spiral waves. So once these spiral waves form, they represent a non-axisymmetric potential that then has a back reaction on the planet. Now, the waves that are interior to the planet orbit generally exert a positive torque on the planet. The waves exterior to the, uh, to the moon's orbit, excuse me, exert a negative torque on the planet. But in most cases, the effect of the outer resonances wins out. And the differential Lindblad torque, as it's known, causes the planet to spiral inward in a mode of migration known as type 1 migration. So this is the time scale associated with this effect, and I'll point out uh, two things of note. First, it's inversely proportional to the mass of the satellite. In other words, for this effect, the bigger you get, the faster you go in. Okay. And it's also inversely proportional to the surface density of the gas disk. The more mass of the gas disk, uh, the bigger these waves and the stronger the effect. So this has been
been looked at um, uh, a lot in the context of planets spiraling into their stars. Uh, but Bill Ward and I were the first to really focus on how type 1 migration could affect the formation of satellites and gas disks. So we have a series of papers, initially analytic and later numerical, where we attempted to model the process of satellite formation, including two important effects. One being type 1 migration, as I just showed you. And the second thing that we included in our models that was novel was that we included an ongoing supply of gas and small solids inflowing to the disk. So instead of assuming a disk that was a closed system with a fixed total mass, we considered a dynamic supply, say as Jupiter or Saturn was completing the last 5 or 10 percent of its growth. So I'll show you results of a numerical simulation here. So we have an in-body simulation that we're using to track the growth of satellite decimals. They're shown here. We add new bodies to the in-body simulation to mimic the ongoing inflow of solids to the disk. And we're treating the background gas disk, which is essentially just an accretion disk, as a viscous disk uh, that is spreading with some viscosity. And we're including the interactions of that disk with these particles. So the bottom left, distance from the planet in planetary radii is showing the x-axis. The y-axis is the moon mass. So what you'll see, each of these circles is one of the simulated satellites. You'll see them move up the plot as they grow in mass. The horizontal lines is proportional to the orbital eccentricity of each object. Okay. So as the satellites grow, you'll see them move up this plot. Then they'll reach a critical mass at which they'll start to spiral inward. Because remember that type 1 migration rate gets faster as they get bigger. So they'll reach a critical mass, and then they'll start to spiral in. Now, for this particular simulation, I'm considering a constant inflow rate of time. So what we're going to see is that generations of satellites form, they grow, and then they spiral inward due to type of migration until they're removed from the left side of the plot. In other words, they collide with the planet or get disrupted in the motion. Because the inflow is ongoing, when you lose one generation of satellites, you typically grow another generation in its place. So in this way, type 1 migration acts like a negative feedback effect on the total satellite system mass, which is plotted here on the right. And like any good negative feedback, it then is causing this value to oscillate around uh, approximately 10 to the minus 4 times the planet's mass. OK, so this is with a constant inflow rate of time. So we imagine multiple generations of satellites may have formed and been lost. But at some point, gas accretion to the planets ended. The solar nebula dispersed, the planets reached their final mass. And the system we see today, we would think, would have been the last generation of satellites to form and survive. So in these simulations, the inflow rate is exponentially decaying with time. So when you consider a time-dependent inflow rate, you essentially resolve the last generation of satellites that forms and then is able to stabilize because as the gas dis dissipates, type 1 migration ends. So in this case, the system forms four uh, satellites that are broadly similar to the Galilean system in terms of their overall masses and their spacing. So an interesting thing is, depending on when exactly the inflow ended, compared to these cycles of satellite formation loss, you can get satellite systems that end up looking very different from the same process. So the second simulation shows all the same assumed parameters as the top one, but a slightly different decay time scale for the inflow. So in this case, you form a multiple satellite system like the Galilean satellites. But before the inflow ends, you end up losing all of the large inner satellites. And so the final stable system is left with just one large satellite, which is you know, a coarse analog for Titan. And that's the Saturn system to show you blue. So this result has um, a couple of implications. Um, I'll talk about one for Jupiter first, and then one for Saturn. So when Stan first saw our 2002 
paper. He was extremely excited. He wrote us right away because as soon as he saw the inward migration of these satellites, and because that third satellite of Jupiter, Ganymede, is the most massive, and because the rate of inward migration is uh, the rate increases with mass, Ganymede migrates in faster than Io and Europa. And Stan immediately recognized that that was a perfect way to establish the onset of Jupiter. So what are these graphs showing? What are these plots showing? So he recognized that this was a great way to, a great alternative way to establish the Laplace relationship. So these are plots from Helium Lake. So this is their um, analytic model for the centimeter axis of the enemy migrating inward due to type 1 migration. And this is the centimeter axis of, of Europa and Io. So in order to track the resonance, you have to have converging orbits. And the bottom plot is showing the eccentricity growth associated first with the, uh, uh, the capture of Europa into resonance with enemy, which drives up uh, Europa's eccentricity. And then the secondary capture that establishes the Laplace relation. Initially, the inward migration of the satellites in Peel and Lee's model establishes the Laplace relation. Now before this, the idea was that the Laplace relation was established by the outward evolution of these satellites. In the same way that the moon evolves outward from the Earth due to tidal interactions with the Earth, so too did the Galilean satellites migrate outward. And so the prior, the, the prior models had thought that this resonant relation was established long after the moon's formed by this slow outward migration due to interactions with the planet. And that put certain constraints on what the tidal dissipation factor in the planet needed to be. But Stan's idea was to do it while the satellites were forming. And actually, Lee and Peel have generalized this type of outcome to inwardly migrating planets in extrasolar systems, where type 1 migration may lead to frequent resonant capture. And when we don't see, when we see resonant relations between some of the exoplanets, but when we don't see them, that may indicate a process needed to have gotten them out of these sorts of systems. So in terms of Saturn, I'm going to replay the, the simulation that produces crudely uh, a Saturn-like system. And what we see is that big Titan-sized satellites are lost to collision with Saturn whenever we're left with a system with just one big moon. In other words, Titan was not always just one big moon. It had big inner sister moons, too. They were lost in this construct. And so an interesting implication there is that the loss of at least that final large Titan-sized object could have been associated with the formation of Saturn's rings. So one of the uh, mysteries of Saturn's rings is if you look at them today, and they're extremely pure in their ice content, less than 10% rock, and we know they've been polluted by gunk hitting the rings for a long time, so that when the rings started, they must have been essentially pure ice. And yet, generic stuff in the outer solar system is half rock and half ice. So how do you get how do you get a ring to be pure ice initially? How do you remove the rock? So the idea here is, if you have a satellite, a Titan-like object that was spiraling in towards the planet, it would have been large enough to have heated to the point of melting the ice, so its rock would have collected in a central core surrounded by an icy mantle. As that satellite spirals in past the Roche it first loses its icy outermost layers to tidal stripping. By losing some of its low density ice, that temporarily increases its mean density and allows it to restabilize before it moves in a little farther. Then it loses a little more ice, increases its bulk density, moves in a little closer to the planet. And in this way, the tides strip off all of the ice first. By the time you're down to the rocky core of the satellite, for a young Saturn, we predict that this core would actually collide with the planet before it was disrupted. And so there may be a direct link between the formation of Saturn's uh, relatively massive ice rings and the loss of its early satellites that caused it to have this one uh, dominant satellite in the system. But the high-level result here is it's kind of the line of 
that's for mass ratio. So where does this come from? It's not a magic number. It's not pi. So where does it come from? So it reflects a balance. So it's a simple supply versus loss kind of system. So the supply is this continuing inflow of solid material to the disk. That sets the time scale it takes for these rooms to form, the rate at which the material is supplied to form. Then the loss time scale is that type one migration. So the rate at which material is supplied to the time scale, the time scale it takes for a moon to grow is proportional to its mass. And it's proportional to what I call F, which is the gas to solid ratio in the inflow, divided by the total inflow rate. The type 1 migration time scale, that's inversely proportional to the satellite mass and the gas surface density. And this is a viscous accretion disk, so we're assuming an alpha viscosity parameter due to some type of turbulence in the disk that causes the disk gas, once it comes in, to spread radially. So as that alpha gets bigger, it spreads faster. So as alpha gets bigger, the steady state, surface density in the disk is lower, and that type 1 migration is slower. It turns out that both the, uh, the gas density and the rate at which the moons can grow, they're both proportional to the inflow rate, and so the inflow rate dependence cancels out of this balance. And ultimately, uh, the mass of the satellites that form, the mass of satellites that have their growth time comparable to their type 1 loss time, when you integrate over the mass of those satellites, you get a total system mass that depends really just on a combination of two parameters. Alpha, that's the, the uh, strength of the viscosity in the disk that causes the gas to spread, so that affects the uh, strength of the loss of satellites by type 1, and F, the gas to solid ratio in the inflow, because that establishes how fast the satellites can form. And the dependence is remarkably weak. That's a good thing, because we actually don't know these parameters very well. So for example, what exactly is alpha is a uh, topic that has been debated for decades in astrophysics and planetary science. Maybe it's 10 to the minus 4. Maybe it's 10 to the minus 1. The appropriate gas to solids ratio in the inflow, well, it would be in order 100 if it was um, comparable to bulk solar composition. But it couldn't be different than that if you had fractionated some of the solids by the late stage of planet formation, for example. But if we put the whole range of these values that are typically quoted in here, so here we're showing three orders of magnitude and variation of this ratio. You end up with systems that consistently have a satellite system mass ratio of order 10 to minus 4. So the points are from lots of body simulations. The solid line is this analytic expression here, and the dashed lines are the current satellite systems. So the takeaway is that. Um, <coughs> this very different distribution of satellite properties, and this is a, a very simple property, just the mass ratio of the system, can be explained by these two processes, impacts and co-formation. On a historical note, when the giant impact period for the origin of the moon was first proposed, there were some people that were very skeptical because they thought you might have to find a very certain type of impact to make the moon at all. So they thought it might be really come. We have done now thousands of these impact simulations. And interestingly, most of the impacts that are relatively low velocity <coughs> and somewhat oblique make moons. And in particular, the same impacts that can grow the planet, the ones that are relatively low velocity as opposed to the high velocity ones that might disrupt a planet, the ones that make the planets grow are very efficient producers of moons. So now we have to have the other we're, we're, We have lots of discussions about why don't we see more? All right? Because we think that all of the solid bodies probably had moons. I think the answer is probably that either uh, we
we lost them due to tidal evolution paths for some of the moons that were unstable, moons that tidally evolved in, if they were around a slow rotating planet. Or perhaps they were scattered away, moons that formed in the midst of planet formation when there was still a large amount of background mass, could, through close encounters with large objects comparable to their mass, be scattered into escaping orbits and be lost. But our thinking is now this is such an efficient way to make moons that probably all the solid, all the terrestrial planets had moons and we just lost them. And then the, the process of forming satellites in these inflow supply disks around gas planets has this interesting characteristic that it tends to select for a common satellite system mass ratio. And we think that this should be a, a general process that would be applicable to uh, gas planets in any system, so long as those planets contracted to something close to their current size before their host nebulas were dispersed. And in that case, we think that uh, this mass ratio should be something that we can perhaps detect in future surveys. So, of course, finding exoplanets is hard enough, but there, is, uh, there are several teams that are trying to find exomoons, and this is a, an extremely difficult thing to do. Um, some of you may have seen the recent uh, paper that um, is focused on a potential uh, moon detection that's going to take some time to confirm. Uh, but just as a thought experiment, I'll, I'll, I'll finish with a plot here uh, where I'm looking at the planet mass and Earth masses uh, versus the largest moon that you would predict from these processes. And the, uh, the diamonds are upper limits um, from, uh, this is Dave Kipping's group out of Harvard. I'm, I'm forgetting the exact year of the publication. So to the extent that moons form through processes like uh, those that we think form the Galilean satellites and Saturnian satellites that probably form within this region here. In other words, if you were interested in looking for a Mars mass exomoon or larger, it would be best to look um, around either a very massive gas giant or perhaps a super Earth that's undergone something like a Kulishara type of Thank you. <laughs>
So if you ask, if we see one captured satellite that survived in our solar system, then what's the most probable size that it would have? Well, it would be the minimum size needed to have disrupted that prior satellite system. So in other words, if we imagine that, I told you this argument was big, but it's interesting nonetheless. If you, if you imagine the original prograde satellite system was down here, then it could have been destroyed by a much smaller object than Triton, and that would have been a lot more probable because there would have been a lot more of it than Triton. So we have a very hard limit on we know Neptune and can't have been larger. And there's a kind of hand wavy probabilistic argument that is consistent with its original system being comparable in that mass to Triton. We actually have a postdoc, uh, Luca Rufu, uh, that wrote a paper with me on this uh, last year in, um, it's either AFJ or AJ, I can't remember which, they're the same submission process, <laughs> in which we show that actually having the prograde system be comparable in mass to Triton gives you uh, not just the philosophical argument I just gave you, but it also gives you a, a better way to um, uh, describe other properties of the moons in that system. The why, why is Mars a poor uh, order of magnitude outlier on this plot? Yes. So that simulation I showed where you make the disk. So that disk mass is actually M mean, minus five. That's created by this impact. And Phobos and Deimos are 10 to the minus eight. So what happened on this moon? So the key difference is Mars' rotational uh, day, even after this collision, is about 25 hours. So instead of a rapid rotator like the Earth, it was a slower rotator, even early on. We know that from the increment of the system. So a satellite only kind of evolves outward. If the planet rotates faster than its angular velocity, only then does the tidal bulge rotate in front. So in this case, what we call the synchronous orbit, so the location in interior to which satellites will evolve in is about six Mars radii. So all this stuff in the inner disk, we propose, did form large moons that were hundreds of kilometers across, and they spiraled inward and were lost over time, and Phobos and Deimos are the last survivors, and actually Phobos itself has evolved inward a lot too, and it's gonna be tightly disrupted in less than 100 million years. So, um, why the why 10 to the minus 5 is different than 10 to the minus 2, like the Earth moon, is because the relative uh, angular momentum is lower and the size of the impact is lower. But that three orders of magnitude to get you all the way down to 10 to the minus 8, it's because the inner mass of moons were lost. So the inclination between the moon's orbit and the ecliptic isn't very big, it's only 8 degrees or something. Is that just a coincidence in the giant impact scenario? No. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> so the current, the current moon's inclination relative to ecliptic is about five degrees. Yep. But it's actually been um, that relative inclination uh, with respect to the local Laplacian plane has been damped with top, with time due to tides. So it corresponds to an even bigger initial Okay. So the original paper on this effect uh, was by Peter Bullright in 1966, who showed that that initial, or that current five degree inclination corresponds to a 10 degree inclination of the moon relative to the Earth's equatorial plane when the moon was in close. So that's big. Because you do a simulation of the moon accumulating from one of these impact generated disks, you get an inclination less than one degree. So all of the solutions to this lunar inclination problem, which is what it's called, because it is in fact a problem, involve some later process to produce this inclination. These have several different flavors. There are some that invoke resonances. Uh, Bill Ward and I in 2000 proposed a, uh, an inner vertical resonance, the three to one bending wave resonance between the moon and the inner disk as a way of exciting its inclination. Uh, Machia Chuk has proposed a Laplace plane 
stability mechanism, envisioning a high liquidity Earth right after the moon forming impact in one of those uh, newer, uh, different giant impact scenarios. Uh, Palomar and Morbidelli, which is the paper I reference here, uh, had the simplest and therefore probably the best um, idea for this, which is um, there were, if you just had the Earth get hit by a Mars side body before the moon, and you impose a reasonable size distribution of stuff that was still around, there would have been things that were moon sized around too. They don't have to have many of those around that if they have many flybys past the Earth, you could random walk the moon's information up to values consistent with the current tilt. Making assumptions about the distribution of background objects and their total mass in the time period right after the moon So it's a very important constraint. Um, so other new work by Matthew Chuck has argued that the original analysis by Peter Goldreich that said we needed a 10 degree inclination is actually wildly off because it didn't include the effect of what are known as obliquity tides in the moon. Uh, when the moon passes through a Cassini state, as defined by Stan Field, Matthew um, calculates that uh, the damping would have been much stronger. And so if you need to start the moon with an inclination when it first forms to be consistent with the current five degrees, you need it to be 30 degrees initially. So this is a much debated topic. Very much. Okay, over. So why are the compositions of the moon rocks the same to the Earth? Right. Why? Well, it's you know when I give up when I give up only about the moon talk, I say you know we get to a certain point that this was an astrophysical problem, and we just knew about these objects from afar. No, we had the right answer. <laughs> we could explain our masses and <laughs> angular momentum and ball densities and just pat ourselves in the back and go home. But we got rocks. Um, and that wonderful thing. So, a bunch of ideas. Uh, one class of ideas, maybe Mars and all the meteorites are compositional outliers. They're at the outer edge of the terrestrial region. Maybe we're being misled. We look at their isotopic compositions and they're really different than the Earth's. Maybe that wasn't reflective of what the final big impactors onto the Earth were like. So, that would be the impactor was just Earth-like class of solutions. And there's some evidence for that because people like Nicholas DeVos out of Chicago have been looking at indicators of the isotopic composition of the Earth, and they find evidence that the last 40% of the mass that Earth accreted was very Earth-like isotopic. There's another class of models by uh, Palawan Stevenson, this was Kaveh Palawan's thesis work, that imagines that right after the moon forming impact, you have this partially vaporized planet like <coughs> this, that you could have had convectively driven diffusive mixing between the disk and the planet that equilibrated their compositions before the disk cooled and formed the moon. So you initially had a disk that looked different from the Earth because it came from the impactor, but you essentially erased the composition by this mixing. So challenging there. It's hard process to model. Hard process to model. Um, standard uh, mixing length theory for how fast the convective mixing would be is marginally fast. And whether or not you could mix material all the way out to the outer portions of the disk where the moon forms in time is not clear. To overcome angular momentum gradients as well. So then there's, then there's then yeah. there's an angular momentum what? Sorry. To overcome angular momentum gradients, which would block mixing. So that gradients. is probably the biggest issue. Yeah. <laughs> because in the inner portions of the disk, you might be co-rotating. This is the point um, that Locke and Wall has emphasized in their recent paper. And so then you, you may have you may have an easier time convective mixing. But once you get into the differentially rotating disk, you're, you're having to overcome that difference in specific angular momentum with distance. Okay. So then there's a the final class of solutions that we've tried. And uh, that's based on uh, a really remarkable uh, finding by Roger Schultz, who's at SETI Institute, who identified a resonance known as the Avection Resonance. It had been known for a long time, but what Matya did was to show that that resonance was capable of extracting substantial angular momentum from the Earth-Moon system and transferring it to the Earth's orbit around the Sun. 
by substantial, I mean could change the Earth Moon system and anchor momentum by a factor of two or three. Very substantial. Okay, so why, why is that important? If such an effect occurred, then instead of the conditions of the moon forming being constrained the way I showed them, to produce a system where the Earth was rotating five hour a day and the Earth disk had current Earth moon system anchor momentum, you could consider really high amount of effects, so two or three times more momentum. If you use the resonance to subsequently transfer the anchor momentum out of the system. And within that class of very high anchor momentum impacts, there are, are at least two different types of impacts that instead of producing a disk that comes overwhelmingly from the impactor, the disk comes equally from the impact of the target with an equal mixture as a plant. So there is no constant. But then we have to remove the anchor momentum. So what's happening right now in the origin we have seven different ideas that are really interesting, but it all involve at some level a, a change in our thinking or an additional process uh, to what we consider previously. And we're in active debate on those right now. All right, I can stand with a proof of getting rocks returning from Mercury to solve this debate. That's Venus. <laughs> <laughs> And this, is, this has been a very captive audience. I've got to cut this off, though, because there's another class that comes in. <laughs> <laughs> so let's thank Robert.